Welcome to Trace 3D Plus Energy and Economics 102. This is the third video in a four video series to help guide you through the basic navigation of Trace 3D Plus. In the next two videos, you will learn how to input key parameters related to running an energy and economics simulation. The first video will cover energy related fields within the building, systems, and plant section of the program. The second video will cover economics, the project summary screen, alternatives, and basic outputs. We will follow an example throughout this video putting to practice what we learn. Let's get started. After this getting started course, you will be able to use an existing load design file to run an energy analysis phase for the building model, model on-site energy generation and consumption, define various energy related system parameters, input economic parameters to perform a life cycle cost analysis, interpret some of the output reports, and know where to look for help. Let's quickly review what you should have learned in the Load Design 101 videos. If you haven't watched the first two videos in this series on load design, it is recommended that you do so before continuing with these energy and economics training videos. In Load Design 101, you should have learned how to create a new project, how to use themes and templates, how to draw a building and use the various tools in the site and building section, how to access and modify room inputs that impact load design and ventilation calculations, how to create zones and assign rooms to those zones, and how to define various airside system types. We will now review where we left off in our example from the Load Design 101 training videos. As we continue to work with the building that was created in the Load Design 101 training, remember that we created an office building with a data center that has three mechanical systems, a constant volume underfloor air distribution system for the data center, a variable volume reheat system for the main office spaces, and a small single zone constant volume rooftop unit for the lobby. As you may recall, we did not define our plants in the Load Design videos. In this video, we will be adding an air-cooled chiller plant and a hot water boiler plant. We will review the information input during the Load Design 101 training and add or modify the inputs relative to the energy analysis. Please refer to the Energy and Economics 102 Exercise Information Document to guide you through the exercise. This document can be found on our e-learning website. You will also need to download the image file createsitepv.jpg. If you did not complete the exercise file from Load Design 101, a completed version can be downloaded from our e-learning website. Let's begin by opening Trace 3D Plus and editing our project. We will review our inputs from the Load Design model and highlight new fields relative to an energy analysis. To transition from a load to an energy project, you will first want to change the operating mode of the program from Load to Energy and Economics in Settings, Interface. You can do this from any screen by clicking the user name in the upper right hand corner which will bring up the user preferences menu. Within the user preferences you can click the interface link and then change the operating mode drop down from load design to energy and economics. Even if you have a project in load design only you can still view it in the energy mode as well. Please note if you only have a Trace 3D Plus load design license, you will not be able to change the operating mode and thus may not have access to some of the energy related fields that we talk about in these next two videos. Accounting for energy consumers that may impact the building utility bill is important to ensure accuracy in energy analysis. Updating your templates within the selected theme can help you make mass changes across a project that will easily adjust your building model to reflect any energy consumption or generation. Here are some of the new inputs that you will find throughout the program that are related to energy and economic analysis. In the Building and Site section of the program we have the modeling method for miscellaneous loads, either load and energy or energy alone, site generators such as wind turbines and solar panels, and external equipment such as parking lot lights. Then, in the Systems tab, we have Energy Rates for DX Equipment and Equipment Schedules. Finally, we have both the Plants and Economics section of the program, which are made up entirely of energy and economics related fields. Let's take a closer look at the modeling method for miscellaneous loads that can be applied using the templates. Open the Enclosed Office Internal Loads template and view a miscellaneous load. 
This load now has an energy only selection under the modeling method dropdown. By selecting the energy only field, Trace 3D Plus will not add this internal load to the space as a load. Rather, it just spins the utility meter type that is referenced from the library. This modeling method field is one field that you may want to consider modifying when converting from a load design to an energy simulation. Let's go back to the Building in Sight section of the program where we will discuss analysis weather from within the Weather tab. Notice that the location Greenwood in Nova Scotia, Canada remains as our weather location from Load Design 101. Within the weather section, there are no interface differences between load and energy, so there is no need to adjust anything here. However, the type of weather used for running an energy analysis is much different than the type of weather used in load design. Load design calculations use a design weather profile as defined by the ASHRAE Handbook of Fundamentals, whereas an energy calculation uses analysis weather, which utilizes an 8760 full year weather profile. We will move on to the Create Site tab next. The only energy field within the Create Building tab that is different and is the modeling method under the miscellaneous loads in the room properties. Since we have already discussed this field and we have completed our building and zoning, we will continue to the site section to add renewable energy sources to our model. It is suggested to review all inputs and make any necessary changes when converting from a load design file to a full energy analysis. For our example, however, we will not be making any changes to internal loads. In the Create Site tab, you will be able to apply external power generators and power consuming equipment when in the energy mode. Our building will have two photovoltaic panels to generate electricity for the building. We will apply this energy generation source to our site and define the properties. We will start by using the Site Plan Images tool to import a site plan drawing and scale the image. We will then be able to add in the solar panels as indicated in the site plan. Open the tool set by clicking the Site Plan Image Tools icon, click the Load Image icon, and select the createsitepv.jpg image file that was downloaded from our eLearning website. Set the same building origin as we did before, in this case the lower left hand corner of the Office 102, and scale the image just like we did before with the building floor plan. Now we're ready to add our panels. Select the Power Generating Objects icon and select the Photovoltaic Array icon. Now we will add the two solar panels with a width of 15 feet and a height of 8 feet in the location indicated on the site plan. Enter 180 degrees for the direction so that they are facing south and double check the tilt angle is 45 degrees. Note: Use the default library member for the solar panels. In future projects that may include photovoltaic arrays, Make sure the solar panels have the correct power generation cell efficiency. To ensure this, you would need to create your own PV panels in the Equipment Library under the Generators category. For this example, we will just use the default numbers. In this section, you can add several other types of generation equipment, such as wind turbines, internal combustion engines, or combustion turbines. You would add these the same way as photovoltaic panels. Similarly, you can also add power consuming equipment by selecting the power using objects icon. These objects include exterior lighting, fuel use equipment, and water use equipment and act in much the same way that base utilities did in Trace 700. For this example, we will keep it simple and only add the solar panels. Now that our building and site are complete for energy, we will move on to refine the existing systems. When we look at an energy analysis from an airside systems perspective, we need to consider the energy usage of airside devices such as fans, energy recovery devices, DX and electric heating coils, and how those devices are controlled. Energy inputs and analysis help you to determine how much energy a system will use and if there are control strategies or other equipment that could be used to reduce the energy usage of the building. Let's take a look at the systems we have already created. To configure the different airside components, 
you will need to go into the System Properties from the Configure Systems tab. Please note that if you are still on the Select Systems tab, you will only be able to view the System Properties. You will not be able to edit them. While in the Configure Systems tab, select the system you would like to configure in the tree and click on Properties at the bottom of the screen or the pencil icon to the right of the system name in the tree. We are going to focus on the Availability Manager, Components, Controls, and Outdoor Air Controls tabs. The Availability Manager section controls many of the schedules for when the system is allowed to run. You can see that there are a number of different options within this section. Users are able to control the overall fan schedule of the system based on occupancy or schedule from the Schedule tab or based on the thermostat tolerance from the Fan Cycling Based on Space Set Point Tolerance tab. Optimum Start allows users to configure the optimum start schedule of the system. The Optimum Start Availability Manager allows the heating and cooling equipment to start operating before the building becomes occupied so that by the time the building becomes occupied, the building is no longer at the drift point temperature, but has been brought to the set point temperature for occupant comfort. Users are also able to set, enable, and disable overrides according to maximum and minimum temperatures using the high and low temperature turn on and off tabs. When the temperature limit is hit, the system will turn on or off depending on what temperature the sensor location is reading. In addition, users can also configure the system to perform a nighttime air purge on the building. This control is used to pre-cool the building during unoccupied hours by increasing the outdoor airflow. We will now move on to the Components tab where users will see all the configurable devices that make up the selected system. Within this section, users are able to change a number of variables depending on the device category. We've already looked at this area to set the static pressure of the fan, but now let's look at the fan type field. In the Office VAV system, we will change the supply fan type to housed FC with VFD, for example. We will also change the full load energy rate of this fan to 3 brake horsepower. We could change the operation schedule of this particular fan, but for now, we will leave it at available all hours so that the system fan is available to run when the system is running. Let's also set up the fans for the data center UFAD system and the lobby constant volume system. For the UFAD system, choose housed FC fan and set a brake horsepower of 3. For the lobby system, we are going to choose a low pressure axial fan and set the full load energy rate to 2 brake horsepower. In the Components tab, we can also view and modify the coil parameters. Let's double check some of our inputs from Load Design. In the Properties for the Lobby System, verify that we have a DX coil selected. Note, this is represented by the Unitary Cooling and Heat Pumps category. Then, set the cooling coil rated full load energy rate to 1 kilowatt per ton. This value represents the energy rate for the unitary rooftop that cools the lobby. Make sure the heating coil is a standard electric coil. Let's also change the UFAD system for the data center from DX coils to chilled water coils. To do this, change the cooling coil category to cooling coils and keep the type as water. Make sure to also change the heating coil to a hot water coil by changing the type to water. We will leave all other information as the default values. Now that we have our system components set, let's briefly look at the controls and the outdoor air controls tabs. The controls tab contains all of the temperature and humidity controllers included in the system. Different supply air reset control strategies can be selected for each individual controller. The various control strategies are detailed in the F1 help. For this example, we will simply use the default values. The Outdoor Air Control tab options allows users to set up airside economizers, set ventilation overrides at the system level, as well as set humidity and heat recovery control. Again, for the sake of time and simplicity, we will keep the default values here. Now that we have the system fully configured and the zones already assigned, let's move on to configuring the plants. 
Plant loops are the hydronic loops used for chilled water and hot water coils, as well as condenser water used in equipment such as water cool chillers and water source heat pumps. These loops are a subset of an HVAC system. They utilize hydronic equipment such as pumps and coils for heating, cooling, and service water heating. In the plant section of the program, we will be defining loops so it is important to understand what the loops represent. In Trace 3D Plus, a chilled water loop would consist of both the blue and green loops in the picture here. The green loop is represented by the piece of cooling or heating equipment. The chilled water loop transfers heat from the system coils to the equipment that will satisfy the load. Then, from there, the condenser loop takes the load and rejects it to the atmosphere. This is represented by the red loop. The yellow loop is represented by the airside system that was defined in the system section. Let's take a closer look at all the loops you can create in Trace 3D+. There are six different types of loops that are selectable in Trace 3D+. Heat exchanger loops allow you to transfer loads between loops. A mixed water loop is the condenser loop from a water source heat pump system, which will typically include a boiler and a cooling tower. A chilled water loop has chillers, and a hot water loop has heating equipment such as a boiler. VRF is a little unique in that the loop being modeled is a refrigerant loop. The plant houses unloading curves for the condensing equipment for these systems. Finally, condenser water loops are the loops that reject energy from a building to a piece of heat rejection equipment such as a cooling tower. Once loops and equipment have been added to the project, we may need to connect the loops together to transfer energy between loops. For example, a water-cooled chiller in the chilled water loop must reject its heat to a cooling tower in the condenser loop. Connecting individual plant loops is done in the Plants tab under Assign Loops. Plant configurations are validated sets of pre-configured loops that are already connected to each other. By tying a water-cooled chiller to a cooling tower in a condenser water loop, you have now created a plant. Depending on what you add for the loops and how many coils are assigned, the plants will have flow rate size for each loop and associated equipment capacities. Plants can be selected through the plant wizard or created manually. The plant wizard has loops that are already defined and assigned, so you can start with a completed working plant. You can also create plants manually by defining individual loops, but the plant will not be finished until you assign and connect the loops appropriately. An example of this would be assigning a chilled water loop with a water-cooled chiller to a condenser water loop with a cooling tower. Now that you have a background on what plants and loops are, let's open up Trace 3D Plus and take a look at how to select them. In the previous load design example, we used an automated plant and skipped over the plant section. The automated plant was the default simple district cooling and heating plant. However, to run an accurate energy analysis, we'll need to input specific cooling and heating equipment. Continuing our example, there will be two air-cooled chillers for the chilled water coils and a boiler for the preheat coils. If you remember, we defined two systems that have chilled water and hot water coils, the VAV office system and the underfloor air distribution system. These coils will need to be assigned to an appropriate plant. We left the lobby system as DX so we won't need to worry about those system coils. Before we can add our specific equipment, we need to delete the chilled water and hot water loops that are currently selected. Navigate to the Select Plants section, then click on the loops in the tree on the left and click Delete. Now we shouldn't have any plants in our project, so we can move on to define the new plants. Let's use the Plant Wizard to define the plants for our example. Click the Plant Wizard button in the top left-hand corner of the Select Plants tab. Note the Plant Configuration Types drop-down filter which features heat pumps, water-cooled, air-cooled, and VRF configurations. Plant configurations are combination of loops from the loops library. These loops have the supply and demand connections already established for the various components that need to be assigned. For example, the water-cooled constant volume chiller and tower with a single boiler already has the chiller condenser load assigned to the cooling tower. We can see this by viewing the individual loop diagrams for each loop and viewing the loads that are assigned. To continue on with our example, we need to select an air-cooled chiller for the chilled water coils and a boiler for the heating coils. 
Click on the single air-cooled constant volume chiller, single boiler, and click Add this plant configuration. You can now see that the tree is populated and we have selected a plant. If additional loops or plants need to be added, this can be done from the top navigation bar. The properties of the plant equipment can be viewed in read-only format by highlighting the loop and selecting Properties in the bottom left corner or by clicking the pencil icon. Now that we have our plant selected, we can move on to configure the equipment in our plant design by clicking on the Configure Plants button. The Configure Plants tab is where you can add more chillers, move pumps, and edit specific details of the loop design. By default, the first loop in the tree will be selected. When you select the loop you want to modify, the bar at the top will display the components you can add into the diagram. When you select a component, for instance, another air-cooled chiller, it will show you the available equipment node where the equipment can be placed, signified by a green icon on the diagram. Let's go ahead and add an air-cooled chiller in parallel for redundancy. Notice the equipment is added to the tree where it can be renamed for easier identification. You can also rename loops and other objects either in the tree or in the properties section. Once something is added on the configure plant screen, it is recommended to scan for errors using the magnifying glass icon. This icon runs a validation check on a particular loop to find any errors or missing components. In this case, you will see that it indicates that we are missing controls for the chiller that we just added. Clicking the magnifying glass for this piece of equipment will highlight the component in the diagram. Scan for errors will be available in Configure Plants, Assign Loops, and Assign Systems. To get rid of the error, close out of the validation screen, select the controller, and then click the green icon to connect the controller to the chiller. When a chiller or piece of equipment is added to the Configure Systems diagram, we automatically assign it a default library member that has set performance characteristics. To edit the performance of the chiller, highlight the chiller and open the properties. Here, on the Components tab, you can see the chiller's performance characteristics. For this video, we will just focus on the basics. Change the chiller to a 70 to 130 ton air-cooled scroll chiller. Notice. This changes all of the associated details about that chiller in this project. For example, the full load energy rate was adjusted. The other sections available in the Properties section which impact loop sizing and control are Loop Sizing, Controls, Availability Manager, Demand Loads, and Sequencing. Loop Sizing contains inputs for design temperatures and fluid types. Controls dictate what temperatures the loop will be controlled to. Availability managers are controls for turning the loop on and off. Demand loads are process loads such as domestic hot water or any manufacturing processes that aren't building loads. And finally, sequencing allows you to define which chiller turns on first and how the chillers operate together. Now that we have finished configuring the chilled water loop, we can also do the same to the hot water loop if necessary. For simplicity, We'll use the default design and simulation parameters for that loop. The next section is the program is the Assign Loops section. In the Assign Loops section, users are able to assign loops to each other. As an example, a water-cooled chiller rejects heat from inside the building to the outdoors by using a cooling tower or a condenser water loop. In order to do this, the water-cooled chiller must be linked to a condenser loop within Trace. This screen is automatically complete if using a standard plant configuration from the Plants Library or Plant Wizard. As you can see here, since we selected a pre-configured plant, there is no need to assign anything. Additionally, since there are only air-cooled chillers and a boiler plant, there is no need to make any loop assignments. If we click on a loop, for example the chilled water loop, the tree will show us what loops can be assigned to the highlighted loop. There are three buttons in the bottom left-hand corner of the Assign Loops screen. The Loop Manager button will open or close the Assignments tree. The Clear All button clears any loop assignments that have been made thus far. The Scan Errors button is a validation check and will create an alert for any errors found in this section. If we did have any loops assigned to each other, 
Then we would be able to view connections through the diagram using the icon that looks like an eye. Click the eye to jump to the corresponding loop that is connected. Since everything is assigned, we can now move on to the Assign System section, which will allow us to assign the airside systems and respective zone level equipment to the specific plant loops. Since we have a VAV system with zone level reheat, we can use the Auto Assign feature in the bottom left hand corner. This will automatically assign all cooling coils to the cooling loop and all heating coils to the heating loop. If you had a system containing dedicated outdoor air units, as well as zone level units tied to specific cooling loops, you may want to manually assign the coils to different loops instead of auto assigning. The System Manager button will show which coils can be assigned to the selected loop. Additionally, clicking on the chilled water loop should show us the VAV system in the demand box. Click on the VAV reheat system and click Show to view this system. That concludes the first part of our tutorial video, Energy and Economics 102. Don't forget to watch part 2 where we will cover the Economics tab as well as calculating and viewing results. If you have any questions about this software program or any other modeling or CDS software questions, please feel free to contact CDS support at the phone number or email listed here. Also, take advantage of our e-learning videos and answers that are located on our website. Thanks again for watching and we wish you continued success.